Hello ladies, welcome to another ladies Bible class. Today we're going to look at Romans chapter 8. We're going to try to get through the first 11 verses. I absolutely adore this text. Do my best to get through it all. Um, and let's just talk to the Lord and ask Him to teach us. Father, I thank you so much for Romans 5 through 8. I thank you for the Apostle Paul. I thank you for the word that you gave him. Thank you for the encouragement. Thank you for delivering us from the power of sin taking us out of Adam, placing us into Christ, taking us from being slave to sin, a slave to righteousness. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for paying the debt for our sin and delivering us from the body of this death. Thank you for fulfilling the law. Thank you for making us good enough. Lord, I pray that your spirit would just speak through me. They don't need to hear me. They need to hear you. So thank you for the mind of Christ in me. Thank you that you're going to teach us. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we looked at the last part of chapter 7, which everybody's like, yeah, I so identify with it. Everything I don't want to do, that's what I do. Everything I want to do, I don't do. Ah, you know, what's going on here? And it's called the power of sin. And it wages war in the members of our body. And it's constantly trying to deceive us. Again, remember this. I just shot my nugget and talked about how, you know, the moment we accept Jesus is the moment that that prison door gets unlocked. We are set free. For whom the Son is set free is free indeed. And not only does He unlock the door, He disables the mechanism that can lock it again. It can't be locked. The enemy wants you to think it can be, but it's disabled. It's broken. And so what the enemy wants to do is tempt, accuse, and deceive, lure us back into that prison cell, get us to plop down there and think, I'm never going to be free. I'm in bondage to anger, lust, addiction, you name it. No, no, you're, you're not in bondage to anything. You're free to get up and walk out of that cell and walk in the power of the Spirit instead of the flesh. But the flesh is familiar. It's comfortable. Walking in the Spirit is new. It's beautiful. It's amazing. But it's new and it's like, oh, I don't feel like I'm in control. Guess what? You're not. He is. And that's glorious. So I'm ranting and raving and preaching. So let me stop there. Watch the nugget. I go off on this and that one. That's coming out on Monday. So uh, chapter 8, you know, at the end of chapter 7, he, he starts that declaration. He's like, thanks be to God through, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God. But on the other, my flesh, the law of sin. Verse 8, chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore, this is a concluding statement, no condemnation, no punishment, no not guilty, I mean, excuse me, woo, no guilty verdict ever against us. Why? Jesus paid the penalty. He took the guilt, the shame on him. We were given his righteousness in exchange for our sin. He paid the penalty in full. We're not under the law. You cannot break a law that you're not under. If I go to a foreign country and I have diplomatic immunity as an ambassador, the laws of that country do not apply to me. I have diplomatic immunity. They can't touch me. Beloved, we are now citizens of heaven. We have diplomatic immunity here. This is not freedom to go send up a storm, as some people with diplomatic immunity have done. No, we are free from sin, and we represent as ambassadors of the gospel the kingdom of heaven. Oh, that's pressure. Not really. When you understand who you are, you understand your rightness with God. You understand that his life is in you, flowing through you. You can learn how to put off that flesh pattern of looking horizontal for your needs and rest in the vertical that you're accepted in the beloved. All these things out here that say you're not good enough. Jesus says, no, sorry, you are good enough. You're good enough because I've made you good enough. And rest in that. Whom the Son is set free is free indeed. We are free from the law, free from the power of sin free to function in the fullness of the Spirit. There is now, therefore, no condemnation, no punishment, no guilty verdict for those who are in Christ Jesus. Period. If the enemy's yapping at you, 
using accusing spirits, trying to get you to rehearse all the mistakes you've ever made, you look at him and say, not guilty. Filed in the court of scribes, not guilty by virtue of my faith in the shed blood of the Lamb. Deal with it. He's got no answer to the shed blood of the Lamb. You apply the blood. You speak it out. That's been covered by the blood of the Lamb. You want to talk to anybody about it, talk to Jesus. He's going to tell you it's paid for in full. So this is his concluding statement that he starts out with, for those who are in Christ Jesus, there's no guilty verdict for us. For the law of the spirit of life, we are now reconnected to the tree of life. We are no longer under the curse of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We don't have to be good enough. We've made good enough in Jesus. We now are connected to the tree of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. There is no good and evil. There is now only life and death. And because we are now connected to Jesus, the tree of life, there is now therefore no death, no sin and death for us. That's the principle. That's the law that we are now under, beloved. For what the law couldn't do, the Mosaic law couldn't save us, could not make us good enough before God. Weak as it was through the flesh, it was weak not because it inherently had weakness. It was weak because we were weak. The flesh could not Keep it. We could not be good enough. Why? We come out of the womb under the authority of sin, not God. And we couldn't keep the law. Didn't mean the law wasn't good. Just meant that we were the weak link. And we couldn't keep it. So what did God do? What the law couldn't do, God did. The law couldn't redeem us. So God did. How did He do it? He sent His only begotten Son in the likeness of humanity in the likeness of flesh and as an offering for sin he condemned sin in the flesh he put it to death he put sin to death he put our flesh to death because Jesus was good enough on our behalf and God poured out all his wrath the wrath that we deserved, that Adam deserved for us to give us his righteousness. In order, verse 4, in order that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. The law required us to be holy and pure and perfect. He made that happen in us by giving that exchange. God always trades up, beloved. He took our sin and gave us His righteousness. When you surrender something to Him, He always gives you something so much better in return. The law's requirements were fulfilled in us. Who do not? Who is us? who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. According to the flesh. Let me keep reading because that will explain it. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds. That's a really important phrase there, folks. Set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things in the Spirit, For the mindset on the flesh is death. You've heard me quote this so many times. But the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God. For it is not even able, has no capacity to do so. And those who are in the flesh, that's a key preposition. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God, cannot please God. I think this might merit some a list here.
these guys are in the flesh in Adam sin is the master we are in the spirit in Christ we are slaves righteousness is our master Jesus quite a contrast so this person is in the flesh and can only walk according to the flesh this person being in Christ has a choice I'm going to set my mind this one the mindset is always on the flesh and always on death or what we call the lack mentality scarcity or lack they're always wanting more somebody asked John Paul Getty or whoever the Getty dude is how much is enough money and he always his response was just a little bit more that is a lack mentality from a very wealthy man why? Because the things of this world will never satisfy. The things of the flesh will never satisfy. There's always going to be a lack. This is why people who achieve all that the world says will make you happy are absolutely freaking miserable. And they're usually caught up in some sort of horrible addiction and perversion. Satan, those who follow Lucifer, have been sold a lie. Follow me. Give me your soul. I'll give you everything that will give you life. I'll give you fame, fortune, conquest, you name it, power, prestige, you name it. They're always running fearful because they feel empty and lacking because they are. Because there's no life in the flesh, only death. For those that are in the Spirit, and they walk according to the Spirit, Oh, here's my pen. See how this one works. They walk according to the Spirit. There's life. Peace. What we call the abundant mindset. Okay? So the person who is in Adam has no choice. They're always going to fly through life on the horizontal plane because they're not reconnected vertically to God. And so they're going to be manipulative. They're going to be walking in the flesh. Um, they're going to be either dealing with prime rib flesh, plain vanilla flesh, or yucky flesh. They're going to be either addicted to stuff that destroys them, or they're going to be addicted to things that, eh, it's not that bad, carbs or something like that. Or they're going to be driven along to be addicted to exercise and health food and achieve, 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 get more stuff, get more stuff, be famous, get more people to know you and love you and have more power and authority over you and all that kind of stuff. Achieve, achieve, achieve. And then when they're at the end of their life, they're like, oh, you what did I do? What do I have? I'm going to die like everybody else. Who's going to get it then? There's no life here. I love it. Life comes from the vertical, not the horizontal. Okay? And so when we've been reconnected to the Spirit, we have an option. We can set our minds on the things above. We can rest in God declaring us good enough in Christ Jesus. He loves us. He delights in us. His opinion of us is where truth is. And remember, if God says one thing about me and somebody else is saying another, where is truth? It's with Him. Who's easier to believe? Over here. Why? Because they're loud and physical. It is by faith that I choose to take God at His word. I've never physically seen Jesus. I've never saw Him die on the cross. I have been to Jerusalem. I have seen Golgotha. I have seen the empty tomb. But I believed long before I actually saw the places. Beloved, when He came out of the grave, so did we. We have been given life. We are no longer under the law. The verdict on our case is not guilty. It will always be not guilty. 
We are no longer slaves to sin. We're no longer under the law. We now serve a different law, the law of the Spirit. And that law of the Spirit is very simple. Love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. My neighbor is myself. When I do that, I'm going to fulfill the Mosaic law too, by the way. I'm not going to cheat. I'm not going to steal. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to commit adultery. I'm not going to blaspheme God. I'm not going to covet. I'm not going to do any of that stuff. I'm not going to want to because I'm right with God. And out of the rightness that He has given me, I will live rightly in His strength for His glory. I don't have to try harder. I have all the try I need in Jesus. So, Lord, thank you for doing this through me. Beloved, He is our source of strength to walk uprightly. Our responsibility is to set our mind. Where am I going to look? Up or here? Beloved, there will be things that trigger us to go <gasps> out here. It's an easy adjustment as we engage the Lord and say, okay, what triggered me? What, what lie am I believing? What limiting belief has got a hold of me? Lord, speak truth into that. And He will. This is one of the things that Journey Tools does so beautifully. Helps me sort this stuff out. And these tool sets work beautifully on interacting with the Holy Spirit in a way that, you know, when we are triggered to focus out here, we can go back and say, okay, who taught me that? Where did I learn that? What lie am I believing? Is there a vow that I've taken? Who taught me this flesh pattern? Who told me that I'm not good enough? And beloved, when we get there, we're going to be freed up to function in the fullness that is ours in Christ, to walk according to the Spirit. And he's pointing out here is um, when we're walking according to the flesh, when we're walking after the flesh, what we do will not please God. We always bring Him pleasure. He is never disappointed with us. He absolutely always knows what we're going to do. We always bring Him pleasure. But when we choose to function out here and set our mind out here, it doesn't please Him when we choose to walk after the flesh. And He will correct us like a loving Father and get our attention. Hey, look up, Robin. Don't look out here. Look up. I define you, not them. Okay, for the unbeliever, all they can do is look out here. And they need deliverance from that. The flesh cannot please God. It is absolutely hostile to God. The flesh says, I want to do what I want to do. I will be as God. I will decide. I am the master of my own ship, the master of my fate. I will look back on my life and I will say I did it my way. And in the end, it results in death. There's no life there. There's only misery. Verse 9, we have a contrast word, however. This always indicates contrast. However, you are not in the flesh, but rather you are in the Spirit. Since, indeed, if you could take if out and put the word since. Since, indeed, the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of God, he does not belong to him. Okay, this is an indicator. No connection. To the Spirit. Okay? The saved person is in the Spirit. Okay? The Spirit of the Lord has sealed them, declared them. This one belongs to God. Okay? And in our spirit, we're justified. We're made holy. We're made pure, and the Spirit of the Lord takes up residence. And he very simply says, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. And if Christ, and since Christ is in you, Though the body is dead or dying because of sin, yet the Spirit is breathing life into you because of righteousness. So our body, this picks up on chapter 7, our outward body, this thing is decaying. We're going to get a new one soon, I hope. But inwardly, we're experiencing the abundance of of God's life in us. In our, in our spirit, we've been justified. We've been made holy. In our soul, mind, emotion, will, we're being sanctified and transformed. In our body, we'll be glorified at the end. Rapture. Since Christ is in you, the body, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But since the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, 
He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life in your mortal bodies through his spirit who indwells you. We are promised, beloved. We're going to get new earth suits. He is going to be faithful to complete that which he began in us. And it is a beautiful thing to know that we have been taken out of Adam and placed into Christ. It is a beautiful thing that God does not punish believers. He, there's a difference. Let me go back to chapter 8, verse 1. I love it. I want you to understand this. So many times, and I grew up under this. I grew up and was saved, presented the gospel, got saved when age 7, grew up in a legalistic religious church that basically gave me a list. Here's all the things you're not allowed to do. Here's a few things you can do. Don't have fun and God won't zap you. Oh! <gasps> Okay, then let's add to it. My brother dies when, I, when he's 21, I'm 10, and the enemy slips in there and says, you know, your brother died because of sin in your life. God zapped you. That was a lie. Didn't realize that until I was much older, and the Spirit of the Lord got a hold of me and, and brought correction to that, and I thank Him for it. My beloved, when you grow up in a religious system that says, all right, you're saved by grace, but you're kept by works. you got to be good enough. Duh! I was good enough the moment at age 7 when I accepted Jesus as my Savior and the Spirit of the Lord came in me. I remember that moment. I don't remember anything else from age 7. I remember breathing in the Holy Spirit. Like all of a sudden I was alive. Because I was. And I was set free. Unfortunately, I didn't learn how free I was till I was in my 20s. I'm still learning the ramifications of it. All that said, beloved, so many times we, we think, okay, let's say I indulge my flesh and I get tripped up by the enemy and I get triggered to look out here and I indulge my flesh and then the enemy turns around and says, you no good so-and-so, God... God hates you. And then, and then as a consequence of my choice, something, something painful happens. And I think, God's punishing me. Here's the problem. We use punishment and discipline interchangeably in the English language. They mean two different things. Punishment is you broke a law, you have to pay the penalty. You go to jail, whatever. And it's all to teach, don't do that again. It's really not about, it's about paying your debt to society. You pay your debt to society. Discipline is different. It's motivated by something completely different. When you see this discussed by the writer of Hebrews, we learn that discipline is for our benefit. It is always motivated by God's love for us. He will discipline us. He will allow sometimes just the natural consequence of our choice to play out, and it hurts. And we think, oi, oi, that hurt. I shouldn't do that. I need to correct. It is meant for correction, and it's always motivated by love. It's to correct us to remember who we are in Christ, to get us to look vertical. It is to motivate us to root out the limiting belief that has led me to go here instead of here. It is to drive me to the Lord, not from Him. Beloved, God is not chronically cranky. He is not angry with you. He is not disappointed in you. God cannot be disappointed. He always knows what we're going to do. His expectations of us are perfect. Disappointment comes when we have an unrealistic expectation. And God's real, His expectations are always based on truth and reality. Beloved, He loves you. He delights in you. He is not about to punish you. He will discipline you because He loves you. Why? He wants you to adjust your mindset. He wants you to learn to live in His grace. And it's the grace of God, chapter 2 of Titus. It's the grace of God that teaches us to say no to ungodliness, not the law. Grace says, here's who you are. No one can consistently behave in a way that's inconsistent with how they see themselves. If you wonder, This is why the enemy pushes so hard back on the church understanding that they're saints, not sinners. Satan doesn't want us to believe that. Because if I believe and understand that I'm a saint in Christ Jesus, I'm holy, I'm right, I'm pure, I'm going to act like that. 
because when I don't act like that, it's going to really bother me and I'm going to adjust and correct and come back under truth. And I'm going to go and root out, oh, Lord, who taught me to do that? Where did that come from? Because that's not me. That's not who I really am. And the Lord will bring that course correction and adjustment in our soul, in our spirit, and root out the lie we're believing, root out the vow, root out the flesh pattern. All the while we're walking in freedom. Freedom that comes from being connected with Him through grace and mercy. Not through the law. Not through the law. I'm not saying the law is bad. I'm saying that I'm pursuing God under a different law, the law of the Spirit. The Spirit that has restored us to Christ. We're going to pick up on this next time. I want, to, I want to encourage you to get into the habit of setting your mind first thing in the morning. Good morning, Lord. This is the day you've made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, I need you to do everything through me. Thank you that you love me. Thank you that you're with me. Thank you that there isn't anything that's going to happen to me this day that you're not aware of and don't already have a solution for. And Lord, I thank you. I thank you, thank you, thank you that nothing anybody says about me that's contrary to what you say is true. So Lord, you love me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And Lord, again, we just praise you and thank you for this magnificent grace, this grace upon grace that you've poured out upon us. Thank you for making us right in Christ Jesus. Thank you for giving us the mind of Christ. Thank you that we're set free. We are no longer in bondage. No longer in bondage to sin or the flesh. Teach us to set our mind on the things above, not on the things of this earth. Teach us to set our minds on the Spirit. To take every thought captive. To think on that which is good, right, pure, lovely, of good repute. To practice these things and knowing that your peace will be on us. Thank you again, Lord, for all that you're doing. Thank you that you're coming soon. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to continue our journey through this awesome chapter 8 of Romans next week. If he tarries, we'll see you then. God bless. Have a great week in Jesus.